Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to the 88th live program on orthopedic principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Saurabh Agarwal from the United Kingdom. You have listened to Dr. Agarwal's lectures earlier, and it has been such an engaging lecture, and it has already reached to a lot of people all over the world. Today, Dr. Agarwal is going to discuss on the current concepts in the management of treadable trial, Montague fractures, and radial head fractures. Over to you, Dr. Agarwal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hitesh, uh, for your very kind invitation. And hello, everybody, uh, and thank you for your time. So yeah, uh, I'm Agarwal. Uh, I'm a trauma and upper limb uh, surgeon at Princess Royal Hospital, London. Uh, so the talk today is terrible triad injuries, Montagia fractures to elbow. We're going to touch a bit upon radial head fractures as part of terrible triad. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Hite said, uh, these are the current concepts. This is all evidence-based uh, sort of latest uh, way of managing these injuries. Uh, so first, uh, about the stabilizers to elbow. Uh, elbow, like with any joint in the body, uh, it'll have bony stabilizers and it'll have uh, dynamic stabilizers. Bones, we all know, it's going to be, it is radial head capitalum, so radio capital or joint, uh, ulno humeral joint, so trochlea, coronoid, and at the back is olecranon. And then ligaments. Now, ligaments are important because they will come repeatedly in the uh, slides. Uh, when you're doing surgery to terrible triads. So let's look at them a bit carefully. So lateral ligament has got an annular ligament, a radial collateral ligament, and lateral ulnar collateral ligament. But this is the most important uh, limb. So it comes from lateral epicondyle and it sits on the supinator crest of ulna. It is this ligament in 95% cases it will come off the lateral epicondyle along with the extensors, which is where we repair it back. It is this ligament which gives PLRI, posterolateral rotatory instability to the elbow, which is the most common instability. So this ligament is important. Its anatomy is very important, its origin insertion. Then needle collateral, again, there is, again, three parts. Uh, oblique part, a posterior part, but most important is this anterior limb of the MCL. Again, it's coming from, well, just below medial epicondyle. So insertion is onto the, there's a little knobbly bit of bone there, which is known as sublime tubercle on the anteromedial facet. And that's where it is inserted. Now in MCL case, more often than not, it will come off the sublime tubercle. Whereas in LCL case, it comes off the humerus from the epicondyle. So remember that difference. And then finally, there are the dynamic stabilizers. So there are four flexors, your pronator teres, FCR, Pomaris longus, FCU. There are extensors, we know them, uh, ECU, EDM, EDC, uh, uh, ECRB, and then your uh, biceps and your brachialis. So these are the dynamic stabilizers, all right? Now, remember biceps and brachialis are inserted in the front. Uh, why I'm pointing this is uh, when we come to a concept of dynamic congruity, remember biceps and brachialis are in the front, they cross the elbow joint, brachialis sits onto the coronoid, biceps inserts onto the bicipital tuberosity, so they are the flexors of elbow. Of course, biceps is also a supinator. But remember, they are the flexors of elbow. Uh, so once we've seen the stabilizers, uh, let's go to the elbow dislocation. So we know elbow, it can be a simple dislocation in which there is no fracture, or it can be a complex dislocation associated with a fracture. Uh, simple dislocation, uh, common case, uh, in a &E in our clinics, shoulder and elbow, two common jo joints in upper limb which dislocate. So we get, a, more often than not, it's a posterior dislocation. Uh, 
This is a reduction maneuver. We all know that. Bit of thumb pressure onto a late renin and elbow should reduce easily as we've all done it in our practice. Uh, now, if I show you the next slide. So remember, more often than not, secondary stabilizers, the dynamic stabilizers, the extensor muscles and the flexor muscles will be intact. Uh, and this is the reason 98% of the elbows you can manage uh, non-operatively. So we know even from the systematic review uh, that there's no benefit uh, in early surgery. So even though MCL and LCL is gone, uh, idea is to give them a plaster slab for 10 days and then get elbow moving early, get them going. No point giving a plaster for a month. Uh, so, uh, and then this point is important. Severity of soft tissue injury equals your prognosis. What's, what they're trying to say here in this paper is uh, two out of 100 elbows will sublux or dislocate. Uh, so a patient has come to any, you've given a plaster. When a patient comes to you uh, week seven, a uh, week, day seven, day eight, so you will notice in two out of 100 elbows, elbow has subluxed or dislocated in the plaster. This two out of 100 elbows are those ones where along with MCL and LCL, your dynamic stabilizers, your extensors or flexors have also gone. So hold the elbow and it dislocates. And it is this 2%, two out of 100 elbows, which you need to take to theaters, do a EUA and a ligament repair. Uh, again, this paper basically said the same thing, uh, that uh, there's no difference whether you do a surgery or you manage them non-operatively. Idea is to get them going early, give them a plaster cast even for two weeks, not even three, and get them going. Uh, dynamic congruity. Your dynamic, your biceps brachialis uh, contract and keeps the elbow reduced. Now we've seen a posterior dislocation, a simple posterior dislocation, but remember a medial dislocation. So you can see here, uh, ulna has gone medially. So it's a medial dislocation, simple because there's no fracture. Now this is a completely different kettle of fish compared to a posterior dislocation. Uh, and the reason for that is we know from this paper, these are the ones if you reduce and put them in a plaster, almost all of them will dislocate. So there's no point wasting two weeks of a patient. These are the ones which you need to take to theaters. You can do a EUA and then because it's gone medially, so your lateral ulnar collateral ligament and the whole complex has come off uh, along with your extensors. So it needs a repair to your, your lateral ligaments and your extensors. So you can see here, elbow has dislocated medially and uh, we put our anchor here, uh, we put an anchor there, right in the center of capitellum, that is the isometric point of your lateral ulnar collateral ligament. So you can put one anchor, you can put two anchors, you can put one anchor and you can do a drill, whichever way you prefer. Now, uh, remember lateral ulnar collateral ligament, you're not gonna see it on its own. It is a part of your extensors. They all come off as one. So when you reattach your LUCL, you're reattaching your extensors also, yeah? And once you've done that, uh, you do your SAG test and make sure your elbow is congruous. Uh, SAG test again, we'll talk in the coming slides. So, so this was a simple medial dislocation. So when the elbow comes out medially, you're ripping all the soft tissues laterally. So there'll be a lot of lateral bruising. Now equally, you can have a simple lateral dislocation. So you can see in this case, there is a medial bruising because MCL has come off. You can see MCL has come off. Now remember, if I don't know if I can show you with my arm here. So whatever activities we do, we are always giving a various stress to the elbow. A various stress to the elbow means MCL always heals up. Uh, whereas when I'm giving a various stress, I'm stretching my lateral ulnar collateral ligament. LUCL tends not to heal up. 
So if you have a simple medial dislocation, you need to repair your LUCL. But in a simple lateral dislocation, you can just reduce it and get away without operating. So that's the difference between the two. So, so obviously when you see a patient in any, look for the bruising, whether there's a medial bruising, there's a lateral bruising, it gives you a lot of information. So we're talking about this concept of uh, dynamic and static. Static incongruity, dynamic congruity. What it means is static. If, I know there's no plaster here, but if you put them in a, if you put an elbow in a plaster, static, so your muscles are not firing, your biceps and brachialis, which are in the front, they're not contracting, they, they don't have tone. And when an elbow dislocates because of uh, the pain, uh, muscles, there's muscle inhibition, and then you're given a plaster slab in any. So when your biceps and brachialis are not firing, incongruity, a joint tends to sublux. You can see an increased ulnohumeral space. Static plaster, incongruity, incongruous joint. And that is the reason you need to take them off out of plaster as soon as possible. Day seven, day 10, whenever you see them in clinic, get them out of plaster, encourage them to move the elbow from 30 degrees to full flexion. This allows your brachialis and biceps to contract. And you can imagine uh, they will pull the elbow up. It will reduce. So dynamic congruity. Dynamic, your dynamic muscles, biceps, brachialis, when they work, joint becomes congruous. So this is what this paper said, basically, uh, uh, that if you notice this drop sign, uh, if you notice this drop sign, this increased ulnohumeral distance, it can be treated with active exercises. And the reason you avoid various stress or shoulder abduction. So again, if you see, as I was telling you, uh, with various stress, you're stretching your lateral ulnar collateral ligament. Similarly, with shoulder abdu abduction, arm is in various stress. So if you're, you always warn your patient not to show, uh, abduct shoulder for a month because it creates various stress to the elbow and you're stretching your LUCL. And your LUCL gives you PLRI, postrolateral rotatory instability, uh, which is what we don't want. So, so this is important instruction you tell the patient that move your, uh, do an active range of motion of exercises to the elbow. Do not abduct your shoulder for a month and consciously do not like avoid various stress to the elbow to allow LUCL to heal up nicely. MCL always heals up or almost always heals up. This picture I put here to show you the effect of gravity on uh, elbow exercises. So if again, you're doing elbow exercises in this motion, because of gravity, because of gravity, it is going to take your radius and ulna away from the joint. You will get this pseudo subluxation. So ask patients to lie down and then move elbow in this position. This is how we do elbow exercises, whether post-operative or a post a simple elbow dislocation. So here you will see with gravity, how is brought radius and ulna back into the joint. So it keeps the joint congruous. So that's an important principle to appreciate the effect of gravity on uh, elbow pseudo subluxation. So we've seen simple elbow dislocations, posterior, medial and lateral. Medial, different kettle of fish. Medial dislocation equals LUCL rupture. You need to repair those. Complex elbow fracture dislocations. Simple, there were no fractures. If you see fractures, then it becomes complex. Now, fracture dislocation to elbow can be four types. You need, we need to know the uh, sort of the difference. We need to appreciate uh, the, 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 all these four terminologies. So Montagia fracture dislocation. Montagia is, as we all know, proximal ulna fracture and radial head dislocates. It can come out in any direction, anterior, posterior, lateral. We have Bado classification for that. Now, because radial head can come out in any direction, that means the relationship of proximal radius to proximal ulna, PRUJ, proximal radio ulna joint, that relationship is disturbed. Uh, then you can have a longitudinal fracture dislocation through an axial load to a wrist. So if at any stage you see a squash radial head or all these three pieces have all blown out 
always do a wrist x-ray because your drudge may equally be disrupted, very important. So we saw Montagia, now trans renin fracture dislocation. In this, uh, again, there's a proximal ulna fracture. Again, radius has come out in the front. But a big difference compared to Montagia is, here radius always comes in the front with the ulna. And if you see carefully this relationship uh, of your radial head to the sigmoid notch, proximal radio ulna joint is maintained. So that's an important differentiation between your Montagias and your transolacranin. And finally, the terrible triad, uh, the, uh, our topic today, topic of discussion today. So terrible triad is basically uh, elbow is dislocated. So if elbow is dislocated, uh, and again, for discussion today, we will assume when an elbow comes out, MCL and LCL both goes. But practically, LCL goes, MCL may, may not rupture. But, but just to keep it easy from exam point of view, let's assume when an elbow dislocates, whether terrible triad or a simple dislocation, both ligaments have gone. Yeah. So this is what MCL goes, LCL goes. And then either there'll be a coronoid fracture or there'll be an anterior capsule. So pure soft tissue avulsion, capsule avulsion, or a flake of coronoid which takes capsule with it, or a big chunk of coronoid. And then finally, radial head fracture. So these are the four injuries in our elbow uh, dislocation. Uh, so you can see here, let's say both ligaments are gone. Radial head, you can see is fractured. And here it looks like it's a pure capsular revulsion. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to. Okay, yeah, I've got it. Thanks. Uh, and then uh, let's uh, talk about terrible triad injury. So the mechanism is, as you can see in the picture here, you're going to. Uh, a person falls on the elbow, there's gonna be axial load, external rotation or supination and a valgus force. And this is how Sean O'Driscoll from Mayo Clinic, he was the first one to describe this in I think uh, mid nineties. And then uh, this is another concept, uh, mode of failure, circle of hori. This is some, sometimes they ask you in the exams. So the injury number one, injury starts on the lateral side, then goes back in front and then MCL goes. And this is the reason in some elbow dislocation, MCL may be intact. But for purpose of discussion today, we'll assume both ligaments have gone just to simplify in our heads. And then Sean O'Driscoll, there you go. So what he did was uh, he did a cad cadaveric study. And as I was showing you in the last picture, these were the forces he subjected his uh, upper limb cadaver to. Uh, sort of a external rotation or supination for valgus force and an axial compression. And what he found was normal elbow. So there's a spectrum. So for elbow to reach the dislocated stage, it goes from normal through a variety of sort of stages. So the first stage is PLRI, i.e. the first stage is your lateral ulnar collateral ligament evolves off just below your lateral epicondyle from its origin in 95% cases. Only in 5% cases, it will come off its insertion, which is supinator crest of ulna. 95% from humerus. Second stage, if, so if the forces continue to happen to the elbow, elbow becomes perched. So now the anterior capsule is tearing off. Finally, elbow dislocates and MCL may, may not go, even in a dislocated stage. It depends on the grade of the degree of dislocation. So remember these four stages uh, and the distinction. Now, this slide I put for completeness sake, they will not expect you to know this in the exam. So even terrible try, depending on whether there's a valgus force or a varus force to the elbow or a pure axial load posterior force can result in uh, type one, type two, type three coronoid fractures. Uh, uh, but again, you're not expected to know this. Uh, so for example, if there's a valgus force, uh, what will happen is tip of the coronoid will go, which is your type one, according to classification. Uh, radial head will fracture, 
or should frag in most of the cases. Uh, and this coronoid will have capsule with it. And then finally, your posterolateral soft tissues will lift off like your bank cart lesion in a shoulder. So LUCL injury and medial collateral ligament injury. Then if you have a varus force to the elbow, you will have a type two type of coronoid. In the, so you can see here, uh, why do we say varus force? You can see elbow is opening on the lateral side. So it's a varus force. Uh, your coronoid hits the needle uh, condyle and a big chunk comes off. So this is an antromedial facet, uh, which has sublime tubercle. That's where your anterior band of MCL sits, like we saw in the slides before. Uh, and obviously uh, now in this, when the elbow has completely come off, so two ligaments, your lateral ligament, medial ligament in this case is attached to the core, core uh, attached to the anteromedial facet. So medial ligament has pulled off the facet. So those are the two injuries. Third will be your capsule in the front and fourth the radial head. In this case, it is intact. So it can, you can call it a variant of terrible triad. So these are the four injuries, two ligaments, capsular coronoid and radial head. And then finally, if it's a pure posterior force, you can see a big chunk of coronoid has come off. So this coronoid, if you divide it into half, that's anteromedial facet, that's anterolateral facet. So coronoid can come off from the tip. You can have an anteromedial facet, you can have an anterolateral facet, you can have a big sort of chunk of coronoid, a type three coronoid, according to your classification. So again, if you see here, your coronoid fracture or capsule, that's injury number one, radial head number two, and both the ligaments for discussion purpose. So these are the four injuries which will happen in any terrible triad. Uh, now this slide uh, is important. Principles of fixation. Uh, the reason this is an important slide is because th practically this is how you approach your terrible triad in theater. This is, how, this is the sequence of repair. So obviously uh, imaging has to be good in the sense once you position the patient with your eye, like with your femur or tibial nail, you need to image to make sure you're getting good images, AP and lateral. Positioning, I would do a supine, you can do it in lateral also. Approach, I do a universal posterior approach. And then inside I'll do my medial or lateral approach, but you can do two separate incisions, one for your medial approach, one for your lateral approach as the case demands. In terms of fixation, sorry, uh, there are only four structures. We said that uh, coronoid or capsule. So this is the first structure to address. Then you address your radial head. Either you replace it, if there are too many pieces, or you fix it. Uh, then you address your lateral uh, ligaments, lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And then, then you do your posterior sac test. Then if needed, which is very seldom, you do your medial ligament. And finally, uh, the X-fix. In my experience, I've done around 30 elbows in the last five or six years. Is, it almost never comes to fixing MCL if you fix the other three structures. Uh, and X-fix, I have never put an X-fix in a terrible triad, but yes, it may be needed. So this is what I would do in my practice. Patient is going to be supine. I'll take an arm board. When I start, arm come, uh, comes across the chest. That's my posterior incision. I've curved it a bit. Uh, towards uh, radial side to avoid injury to ulnar nerve. And once I've gone through the back, skin and fat make two big thick flaps inside. I can inside, so this, uh, this is a medial approach, we know that. But if I had gone posteriorly, this, these are the flaps you make, skin and fat. And inside, this is what you see, medially and laterally. So I can do any medial approach here and uh, any lateral approach here. So I would always do a universal posterior approach. And once I've done it, arm comes back onto the arm board. Uh, you and your assistant can uh, sit and now very comfortably, you can do your lateral approach or a medial approach. So first let's go through all these approaches. <clears throat> medial approach. Now, uh, so this slide is important here. 
So we were seeing flexors before. Uh, I showed you in the anatomy slide. So there are four flexors. So if you, this is, this is the easiest way to remember. Put your palm and your four fingers on the volar forearm. So index finger is pronator teres, middle finger is FCR, or maris longus, flexor carpi ulnaris. Three approaches, Hotchkiss, Ring and Taylor. Hotchkiss is over the top approach or 50-50 approach. So divide muscles into 50-50. So if you go between FCR and palmaris longus, that's Hotchkiss. If I go between, so we know ulnar nerve comes between the two heads of FCU. So if I go between two heads of FCU, that's a ring approach. And if I lift all the flexor muscles in the front, then it becomes a Taylor approach. Uh, all these three approaches have their role. In the sense, if I have to go very much in the front of the elbow, I will do a Hotchkiss approach. If I'm going towards uh, my sublime tubercle, my anteromedial facet, I'll do a ring type approach. But if my fracture had come right down into the olecranon base or coronoid base, then I'll do a Taylor approach where I have to lift all the muscles to see the whole uh, coronoid. Again, for exam, and before I come to that, so you can see here, this is a pure medial approach. It's not a posterior approach. But you can see if I go through this incision, that's going to be my Hotchkiss approach. If I go through, you can see a nerve there, just behind the epicondyle. We have all done ulnar nerve decompression, so we know ulnar nerve is there. Through the bed is my ring approach. And if I go further down and lift all these flexor muscles in the front, that's my Taylor approach. For exams, you don't need to know all the three approaches. Just remember ring approach. David Ring, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, why ring approach? Because we are, we've all done ulnar nerve decompressions. We know it goes between the two heads of FCU. So it's a it's an easy familiar approach to remember. So remember one approach, a ring approach, medial approach. Then lateral approach again three approaches, uh, like your three medial approach, Cocker, EDC split, and Kaplan. So Cocker is the one familiar to us. Uh, so if we go between Anconius, so these are your extensor muscles, right? So obviously they have shown ECU, then there'll be EDC, there'll be ECRB, so all those ECRL, all those extensor muscles. Anconius we know is coming from the humeral epicondyle and it sits in this triangle in the ulna there. Yeah, so you can imagine I've drawn this black line here. So this is ECU, Anconius will be here. So between, so let's go back to this diagram between Anconius and ECU is your Cocker approach. But if I come more in the front, EDC, and you can see this black line, that's EDC. If I go through EDC, why this is EDC? Because it's supplying all the four fingers, you can see the extensor tendons. So if I go in the middle of that, here, that's EDC split approach, which is what I do for most of my elbow work. And then if I go further anterior between EDC and ECRB, this black line, that's my Kaplan approach. Again, for exam purpose, uh, remember Cocker approach because when I examine candidates, more often than not, they mention Cocker. So remember one approach, Cocker's, Cocker's approach, and you know the internervous plane, Anconius and ECU. All right? And you can see how, and this structure, this fellow there, is your lateral ulnar collateral ligament coming from epicondyle or just below lat epicondyle inserted on supinated crest of ulna. So when I'm doing my caucus approach, I'm going through the fibers of LUCL. Remember this point. Uh, so, so this paper compared EDC uh, with a caucus approach. So if you see this diagram there, this picture there, uh, this is your uh, caucus approach, Anconius, uh, and ECU, and then EDC will be further in the front. So obviously part of this muscle is EDC and part of the EDC is there. So the difference between the two approaches is, as you can see with EDC, I can see the anterior half of radial head. With caucus, it's a postrolateral approach, I can see the posterior half of radial head. Uh, and if you come to this picture now, so EDC approach, 
ETC approach, anterior radial head, anterior radial head, you can see my whole LUCL is intact. This is the reason I personally do a EDC split approach, but you can equally do your caucus approach, but you will be going in line with the fibers of LUCL. Uh, and the reason you don't get PLRIA because of this approach is because in the end, when you're stitching your muscles, uh, you end up uh, taking your LUCL, you stitch it up and it just heals up. You've not disturbed this origin and insertion. You've gone through it in line with its fibers. All right. Uh, but EDC has its own problem. If, uh, because posterior interosseous nerve is coming from the front. So if, if I'm going four, five centimeters, uh, if for some reason I have to put a long plate, then I have to be a bit aware of posterior interosseous nerve. So same, I've again harped on, uh, on the, I'm gonna harp on this point again because Cocker approach is a very common approach. We don't do medial approaches, but we do Cocker approach all the time uh, to address radial head fractures for septic elbows, etc. So same Cockers, so that's Anconius, that's ECU. This is all uh, like I'm going through half of EDC. So you can see this is EDC. That's your Cockers uh, and same Anconius ECU. And when I've gone through EDC, EDC, I've saved LUCL. Now, other important point to remember here is for, for practical purposes, more often than not, radial head fractures are anterolateral in this half. So EDC, with EDC approach, I'm directly looking at them. So that's another important, uh, another advantage of EDC. So we've seen uh, three medial approaches and I want you to remember ring approach for exams. We've seen three lateral approaches and it's up to you. You can remember Cocker's approach or EDC, whatever you've been doing. Then we talked about the order of uh, fixation. So first we need to address the coronoid or the capsule. So what I do is, now, now this slide is important. So if the radial head is intact, then all I can see is that little tip of coronoid. I can't see the whole coronoid. So unless radial is, head is fractured and I'm taking it out in a kidney dish, assembling it and putting it back to fix it with screws. So unless radial head comes out, I cannot see the whole coronoid. I cannot fix the coronoid or capsule from the lateral side, from the lateral cocker or EDC split approach. Remember that. Uh, in that case, then I'll have to go medially. I'll have to do my ring approach to fix the uh, coronoid or the capsule or both. Now, if it's a small flake, i.e. it's a capsular revulsion. So how I would fix my coronoid is uh, two retrograde drills from the posterior aspect of ulna. I'll pass a suture, take a bit, big bite in capsule, come back out, tie a knot. So this fragment comes down where the capsule comes down, it'll heal up. So, so I just showed you suture lasso technique for a little flake. If it's a big chunk there. Uh, so in this case, I will have to go because it's anteromedial facet. We know our anterior band of M cell comes from below epicondyle to the sublime tubercle here. So that has pulled it off. I'll have to do a medial approach ring approach and because it's a big chunk i put a plate yeah we've got special uh contoured coronoid plates uh if you don't have them you can use hand plates for example uh, so first thing to do is uh, address the coronoid then uh, address the second step is to address the radial head so remember there are four structures in total coronoid or capsule Number two, radial head. Number three, uh, lateral ligament. Number four, medial ligament. These are the only four things which you can address at the, at the most. So second is radial head. Radial head, either you can fix it, uh, fix with screws, fix with a plate, or you can replace it, a radial head replacement. These are the three options you've got. If you decide to fix a radial head, it has to be solid fixation to allow patient to move elbow practically day one post-op. 
If not, then replace it. So if you decide to do a plate, so you, this concept of safe zone. So basically, the radial head is an oval structure, number one. Number two, you circle 360 degrees. So this 120 degrees uh, is, your bare, is, is your safe zone. What it means is this part of radial head, whether you fully pronate or supinate, never comes in contact with your sigmoid notch. So if you put a plate in a safe zone, there'll be no impingement. Uh, so remember that. Other little tip to know here with radial head is, so if you've taken radial head out in a kidney dish, and then you assembled uh, the jigsaw, you held it with screws or plates, whichever you do, orientation is important. I'm frequently asked, how do you get orientation of radial head right? So the important bit here is cartilage, thickness of cartilage. So we just said uh, that if, uh, if this is a 360 degree circle, uh, the 240 degrees, which comes in contact with sigmoid notch will have a thick cartilage. This 120 degrees has a very thin cartilage. So you look at the thickness of cartilage, that's how you orient, that's how you're gonna reduce your radial head, all right? Uh, same thing, paper from Ring, uh, guy who described the medial approach to elbow from Boston, Massachusetts. So he spoke about which radial head you can fix or not. So two things important, on table reconstruction is acceptable. So you can bring it out, you can get the jigsaw together, you can hold it with small screws, put a plate if you have to and put it back on. So on table acceptable, radial head. So second important question, vascularity is still not an issue. If you get a stable reduction. If you com compress the radial head, blood supply grows back into radial head. Avascular necrosis is not an issue. So two things here, one is orientation, second is vascularity. Third, up to three pieces you can reconstruct. Beyond that, it's a bit difficult. Important, if you fix it, fix it well enough to allow patient to move elbow. No point uh, fixing a radial head and then putting them in a plaster for six weeks. It defeats the purpose, elbow becomes very stiff. Uh, then again, a bit about fixation. So this is my preferred technique. I don't like plates personally because plates will impinge. Number two, supinator gets stuck onto the plate and they lose uh, supination and pronation. So for with plates, you have to be prepared to go back in and take it out. Uh, with screws, uh, this paper tells you about the tripod technique if someone is interested. So put three screws, they're gonna be cannulated. So use your wires and then use screws. They're going to be headless. You don't want them to be protruding in the joint. They're going to be compression screws uh, and do them in a fashion of tripod. If you can't for some reason, uh, you, can, you, you have to aim to put at least two good, strong, solid screws. Other little tip is this screw here. If it's prominent, then it can cause a mechanical block to rotations or it can irritate the interosseous membrane. So the screw which is coming towards the ulna, you have to be a bit aware of, a bit cautious. Uh, then another thing to say is with radial head fractures, we know Mason classification, one, two, three, four, one is less than one third, two is more than one third, three is comminuted, fourth is associated with the elbow fracture dislocation. Now with Mason, uh, remember as you go towards Mason three and fours, uh, they are associated with a lot of soft tissue injuries, ligament injuries, entrocious membrane injuries. So if you decide to fix, for example, a mason three or a four with screws, the results are not so good, i.e. they can fail, they may not heal. So in a fracture dislocation elbow situation, if it's a very comminuted radial head, three pieces, uh, if you commit to fixing it, you have to fix it really well, Otherwise it's better to replace, remember that. So Mason, isolated Mason three is different to a Mason three in a fracture dislocation situation, uh, two different kettle of fish, uh, fish. Screw, of course, we've told you advantages is not gonna impinge and you're not stripping too much of periosteum. So our preferred method is screw fixation. In out of 30 elbows, I may have done plate fixation in maybe two cases. So plate is seldom used, remember that. Again, this, all this paper tells you is radial head. Uh, so in a mason three and a four, if you think your fixation is not solid, it's better to do a radial head uh, resection. 
now again remember uh, remember uh, i beg your pardon in a isolated uh, sort of a mason 3 not 4 mason 3 isolated you can get away with resection uh of course you still have to rule out interosseous membrane injury those sx lopresti type but in a fractured dislocation to elbow you should never uh, resect radial head you have to replace it isolated radial head if you can't you can get away with uh, resection uh, finally with the lateral approach your posterior interosseous nerve anatomy so we know it comes from the front it pierces supinator and then it comes out at the back and supplies all the extensor muscles now the important uh, thing here is uh if you have if you just if you decide to put a long plate on the radial head and neck or if this area was completely smashed up and you decide to put a long radial head replacement then it's very important to know where the pin is so two things here uh so they have done cadaver studies and what they found is in studies up to 5 cm from the tip of radial head but practically i would say assume take your ruler this is what i do from the top of your radial head i mark 4 cm which is roughly to the end of bicipital tuberosity radial tuberosity and i know those top proximal 4 cm are in a safe zone uh and other thing is if ever you have to take supinator off then it should come out from the supinator crest of ulna because nerve is in the front you want to come take off your supinator from uh, from the back from the supinator crest as far posterior as possible so so i do edc approaches as i was telling you edc is a very approach anti red approach so if i ever decide to put a long plate either i have to be aware of spin or in those cases i'll do my uh, cocker's approach then a bit more about radial head remember as you pro as you pronate supinate forearm your radial head uh, level will change in in respect to the level of coronoid so supination with arm in supination radial head comes up with arm in pronation it goes down so if you're doing a radial head replacement your x ray should be with arm in, in neutral that's when it should be at level of coronoid now so avoid overstuffing but also avoid understuffing both are bad so what i'm trying to say here is see this is uh, uh, radius is overlapping ulna so arm is in neutral now this is not overstuffing this is right amount of this is the right radial head uh, radial height why because coronoid also has a cartilage so radial head should be 2 mm proud that is normal that's compensating for coronoid cartilage if you see the picture here this is this much is cartilage so if i was was to bring my radial head down to match the lower red line i've done under stuffing which is equally bad so doing a radial head replacement this part is very important second tip is get your x rays in neutral third tip is this coronoid ulna ulno coronoid distance you can see it's completely parallel if i had overstuffed my radial head if i'd overstuffed my radial head you can see with the black arrow this distance becomes more distance between coronoid and my humerus this distance becomes less because my radial head has over is overstuffed this is known as delta sign so look for delta sign so if you have a parallel distance i.e. 2 mm prod radial head with forearm in neutral means you've got the height right other thing obviously practically you can do is you will see the sigmoid notch here so you can match the radial head to the sigmoid notch so you've got lots of tips and tricks to get the height right uh, this is one thing where when i'm training registrars they always ask me so i've highlighted that uh, a bit so you can see that distance has increased okay so we've talked about how to fix coronoid or capsule we've talked about how to fix or replace radial head so now two ligaments are left your lcl and your mcl so lcl is really easy uh, as i was telling you that's epicondyle so lcl comes inferior to epicondyle uh, so you should aim for an anchor which is right in the center of capitulum that's the isometric point of lcl origin or lucl origin 
So you do a N mass stitch to your lateral ulna collateral ligament and your extensors. And with the help of this anchor, you reattach it. All right. It, it literally takes two minutes. It is as simple as that. And then comes this concept of posterior sag. So MCL, uh, so once you've done these three structures, capsule or coronoid, radial head, LCL or LUCL, almost never, anecdotally, I can say in, in two, three, four, three or four elbows out of 100, do you, do you have to repair MCL? Otherwise MCL, you almost never have to repair. So how you know is once I've done these three things, then I'll do a posterior sag test. So you get a lateral view to the elbow and uh, so posterior sag is basically your pseudo subluxation or drop sign and you let the gravity take over. Last 30 degrees, not important. So 30 degrees of, so beyond 30 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees of flexion to the elbow. If the elbow is dropping down, this is sagging down. If the posterior sag test is positive, then you repair MCL. As I said, it's very rare uh, if you've done your first three repairs correctly. And same, once you've repaired MCL, you do your SAC test again. If it's sagging, then you put an X fix. I have never put an X fix or seen an X fix being put at least in the last six years. Uh, remember now another concept. You are aiming for a stable elbow. Stable elbow, even if it's stiff, doesn't matter because you can deal with stiffness later by really doing a capsular contracture release. But you, if you have an unstable elbow, which is also stiff, so remember this is a, this is a little confusing thing. It is unstable and stiff. Yeah, so both can exist together. For example, here you can see there is a posterior sac, so it's unstable. There is instability to the elbow, but because of all the capsular contractures, it is stiff. This is worse of both the worlds. You're dealing, you have to correct instability and stiffness, which is a very bad situation to be in. So I'll rather accept a stiff elbow, but a, but a stable, stable elbow. Because stiffness, you can arthroscopically release the capsules or you can do an open release later at six months, nine months. So, so if you were to, uh, so if it comes to repairing MCL, uh, which I'll show you in my x-rays, which are in some case discussions, MCL comes off the sublime tubercle of anteromedial facet. You just put an anchor there, you grab your anterior band of MCL there and reattach it. Like LCL, it is as simple as that. So let's see a few cases. So what we have done so far is we have discussed three medial approaches and we said we'll talk, we'll, in exam, we'll only disc, we'll say ring approach which is approached through the bed of FCU. We have seen three lateral approaches. For example, we'll only stick to cockers. We have seen how to fix all the four structures, your coronoid, i.e. capsule, your radial head, your LCL and MCL. So these are the only four structures. So let's see these cases and see if we are able to address these uh, cases. So these are all my cases from last two years or thereabouts. So 26 male, he had a terrible triad. So basically fracture dislocation to elbow. Uh, how do we know that? So we know elbow has dislocated here. We know there's something going on with the radial head. Hard to know about a coronoid here, maybe a flake, if not capsule is gone. And as I said, for today's discussion, any elbow that dislocates, we assume MCL is gone, LCL is gone. Uh, and then on a CT, the reason I put this slice is see how many pieces radial head is in. So I kind of know I'll not be able to uh, sort of repair it, reconstruct it. I'll have to replace it. So what approach? I would do a universal posterior midline approach. In the exam, you can say I'll, you'll do two approaches, a separate medial ring approach and a lateral caucus approach. It's up to you what to address. So we said first to address is coronoid or capsule, second to address is radial head, third to address is LCL, MCL almost never and that's your sequence of repair. So if you see here, again, to remind ourselves, uh, two drills from the back of ulna, suture goes, grabs the capsule, comes back out, yeah? So if you see the ulna here, can you see, you, uh, I don't know if you can on your screens, you can appreciate these two drill marks. So gone from the back, taken a bite in the capsule, come back out. Now here, 
because I have replaced radial head. That means uh, once I've done my posterior midline approach, inside I've only done a caucus approach uh, because radial head all came out. I could see my coronoid from the lateral approach. I did my lasso technique. Then I did my radial head replacement. Uh, and then finally, uh, with an anchor, I have reattached my lateral collateral ligament. Okay. Once I've done these three things, I'll do my SAC test. This is elbow almost in 10 degrees of flexion. 30. So last 30 degrees doesn't count, even if elbow sags. But you can see here, even at 5, 10 degrees of flexion, there is no sag. I'll know humeral joint is completely congruous. So there's no need to address MCL. But as I said, last 30 degrees, even if it's sagging, I'm not bothered. It's above 30, 30, 40 degrees of flexion. It should not sag. And if it's not sagging at five or 10 degrees, even better, it means it's a solid repair. 50 year old fell down. We know the mechanism, axial load, val uh, external rotation or supination and a valgus injury. Now, important thing here was when I was shown this X-ray, this is June of last year, well, year before last, I could see this little flake. And I thought, is this indicating an anterior band of MCL? I, I was not sure. And then look at this delta sign. Can you see this is not, it's not a congruous joint. Less, less space, more space. And then we said, okay, we'll get a CT scan. We got a CT scan, but see even same day. So you can see this is 116 and this is 220. So within a matter of hour, it dislocated. And CT scan clearly showed me two things. These little four flakes. So these flakes are because of capsule avulsion. So coronoid flakes and capsular avulsion. And this little flake was indicative of an MCL injury. So approach for me is easy. So, so again, what injuries here? We know elbow is dislocated. So LCL gone, MCL gone. Uh, we know coronoid is gone, i.e. capsular avulsion. Radial head is intact here. So three injuries. Approach for me is always universal posterior approach because inside I can then do my lateral approach or a medial approach or both as the case demands. Uh, what to address? Uh, so that's a bit tricky in this case. I'm not going to say anything at the moment to avoid confusion. We'll see the next slide first. Sequence of repair. Uh, again, we know sequences. We do coronoid or capsule first. Radial head second, radial head doesn't need anything done here. Lateral ligament third, and then MCL if needed. Now, another important point here is radial head is intact here. So I cannot address my coronoid through the lateral approach here. So once I've done my universal posterior midline, I'll have to do a medial like a ring approach and then reattach my capsule. So I'll show you now. So I took this patient to theaters. So what I'm trying to say here is if you go back, this elbow may pass away as almost a normal elbow managed in plaster. Obviously, even if you had managed in plaster, you will have an answer in a week when patient comes back. But remember when I did a EUA at almost, so you can see this is a congruous elbow, elbow is 90 degrees. As I come to 70-ish, elbow is already sagging, this distance has increased. When I come to 60, see now it's perching, it's perched elbow is tending to go back. And as I come to 30, 40 degrees is completely out. So as I said, 30 and above, 70 degrees, 60 degrees. If you see this sagging, posterior sag test is positive. You know you need to do something about this elbow. So what did we do? So we did a universal midline, radial head intact. So I did a medial ring approach. Two drills here. I got the capsule uh, back with my lasso technique. And then if you want, just to avoid confusion, you can then address your radial head doesn't need to be addressed. Address your LUCL. And because I've already done a medial approach, uh, so use that opportunity to attach my anterior band of MCL, right? So see the difference here. Radius, lateral ligament, comes off humerus, epicondyle. MCL doesn't come up off epicondyle. Well, it can, but very seldom. Normally, it'll come off the sublime tubercle. So that's the difference, okay? So another case, 43-year-old who fell down, uh, Elbow is dislocated, so we'll have, uh, and if you see the 3D images, so if an elbow dislocates, we said LCL and, and MCL has to go. 
So here MCL anterior band attaches on this uh, subline tubercle. So MCL has uh, pulled off this uh, anteromedial facet. So both ligaments, in this case, ligament is intact, but is averse this piece of bone. So we'll say both ligaments and capsule and radial head is still intact. Mm -hmm. So you can see again, this that's your sublime tubercle. That's where the anterior band of MCL comes. So it's pulled this sublime tubercle off. So this is your whole anteromedial facet. This knobbly bit is your sublime tubercle. And this black line which I've drawn is your anterior band of MCL, yeah? So injury we know, approach, universal approach, because it allows me both the uh, medial and lateral approach inside. What to address? So we'll have to address the lateral ligament. Instead of medial ligament, we'll have to address this anteromedial facet. We'll have to address the capsule uh, and radial head is intact. So, so again, uh, because radial head is intact, I cannot approach, and anyways, it's a big piece of bone. It has to be approached medially, it's very logical. So inside I've done my ring type approach. I've seen my ulnar nerve. Uh, I know where it is. Then I've mobilized my nerve. I've gone through the bed of FCU. And then this is, so I've lifted my, all the flexes in the front and that half of FCU is staying behind. I'll, I'm going to approach this, I'm going to put it back to where it belongs. And because it's a big chunk, I, I will use my coronoid plate. Yeah, these are uh, pre-contoured plate. And again, uh, two drills at the back of Alna, you can see the marks. Suture lasso technique, grab the capsule, come back out, tie a knot. So that deals with the capsule. So if I take you back, so I've addressed my this bone. And since I've approached medially, I have addressed my capsule medially. Then what remains is radial head is already intact. So what remains is my lateral ligament. And obviously in this case, I've not put an anchor. I would have done a drill or sometimes you can do uh, all suture anchors. So you will not see them in x-rays and I've addressed that. And then of course you do your posterior sac, which will be negative and you're fine, yeah. So what I'm trying to say here is take home messages. If your radial head is intact, you cannot come from lateral approach to see your coronoid or capsule. Then you'd ha you have to come from medial approach. In this case, anyways, I've come medially to do my plate. So I've done the capsule also from there. And obviously this LUCL is, takes literally two minutes. You put an anchor and then you reattach your LUCL. Hmm. So another case, 63 year old uh, who fell down, uh, injury wise. So if your elbow has dislocated, so your lateral ligament is gone, your medial ligament is gone. We can see there's a radial head fracture there, is gone. Coronoid seems intact to me. Even if it's a teeny tiny flake, doesn't matter. Either way, it's a capsular revulsion. So there are four injuries, maximum four injuries can happen. Always get a 3D uh, recon image. Uh, that's your best friend because you can uh, you can move them around. You can see sagittal coronals of the 3Ds and it gives you a great idea about your coronoid fracture. It gives you a great idea about your radial head fracture. So here I can see two pieces. Now again, injury we know, approach again, universal posterior midline. Inside I can do my caucus lateral approach and a medial ring approach if I have to. What to address? So we know first structure is coronoid or capsule that needs addressing. Second will be radial head needs addressing. Third will be lateral ligament. And then if I have to, I'll do a posterior sag and a medial ligament if I have to. Uh, so, so in this case, I know I fixed the radial head, all right? So if I bring you back here, so I know this radial head with obstruct for me to see the coronoid or the capsule. So what I would have done is, uh, okay. So I think uh, in this case, because these two pieces could have come out in the dish. So there was enough gap in the front for me to address the coronoid or capsule. If I couldn't have, I would have done a medial approach. Uh, so 
or even in this case if i thought despite taking those these two pieces out i cannot see the coronoid or capsule from the lateral approach then i'll do a medial approach so i can't remember what approach i may have done i may have done a medial approach doesn't matter idea is to use the same suture lasso technique bring your little flake or a pure capsule down and then you address your radial head so i use these three screws here finally you put a anchor for your lateral ligament mcl never needed to be addressed as i always say once you've done three things your capsule your radial head your lateral ligament do your posterior sag it's not and if it's not sagging you just so for example you can see here uh this is around 30 degrees or 40 degrees of flexion and this there's no sag so no need to do mcl so 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 terrible triad uh is 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 a difficult topic it takes a, sort of it took me quite a few years actually uh when i was doing my fellowship to to understand fracture patterns to understand approaches uh to get it in the in my mind but to simplify matters remember when a elbow comes out there are only two ligaments mcl lcl there's radial head and then this capsule which can pull out coronoid or coronoid can come out as a own there are only two approaches to know lateral approach cocker approach medial approach ring approach sequence of repair is important and then to appreciate that if you address your capsule your radial head your lateral ligament mcl almost never needs to be addressed of course if it's a big chunk of coronoid bone which has mcl attached that's a different kettle of fish so remember that then let's talk a bit about elbow instability so we've repeatedly talked about lucl and we saw shown a driscoll a uh, slide that in the spectrum of injury when elbow dislocates first thing to happen is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament comes off the epicondyle and uh, it creates plri all right and this is the most common elbow instability the reason being if i have not in this case for example if i have not reattached my lateral ulna collateral ligament properly uh then this pay, or if it comes off then patient will have a chronic uh posterolateral rotatory instability so this is the most common instability uh so what are the causes so elbow dislocation and i'm sure in india and even in here people from villages sometimes they will just sit on it they'll ignore it and they will come as a chronic case so elbow instability uh uh plri type thing will happen with elbow dislocation that's the most common reason other is your uh, tennis elbows if steroid injections are not done properly if they are and your extensor can rupture because of your steroids or your lateral ligament can rupture that will create plri uh cubitus varus your gunstock deformities because it will stretch out your lateral ligaments that can give plri hydrogenic if i fail to repair it properly that will give plri so so it's very sort of once you understand terrible triad all this is very self explanatory clinical features patient will complain of lateral side pain clicking and instability test wise a common test is uh when they're trying to get up from chair they get instability or uh, a pivot shift test pivot shift now remember uh if i do with a patient awake uh, it is only positive in uh, sort of 30 40% is not uh, sort of is hard to elicit this test with patient awake if a patient is sleeping uh you do it in supine position elbow goes sort of at the back and uh then you get elbow in full supination axial load and in 30 40 degrees of elbow flexion it tends to come out and you'll notice a dimple posterolaterally uh this test can be asked in the exam and the easiest way is to see this uh test on google uh to to get some idea but we do it with patient lying we do it with patient sleep uh forces i've told you and at 30 degrees radial head will come out it creates a dimple that's your positive pivot shift test uh again it's just for i put an x-ray there so you can see in this x-ray 
uh, there's a lot of calcification there, which tells you a lateral ligament would have come out, come off from the lateral side. So calcification in the lateral ligament, which is an indicator that this patient had a LUCL injury in the past. And in a chronic case, if you do an MRI, your ligament will be absent. So what will be the treatment? It's a busy slide, but it doesn't matter. Uh, if it's an acute injury, uh, like your elbow dislocation, for example, uh, or a simple elbow dislocation, for example, uh, el simple elbows, lateral ligament always goes. We don't repair them. We just put them in a, bra uh, in a, in a plaster or in a brace. In two weeks, we get them going, isn't it? So, so as I was telling you, last 30 degrees doesn't matter, but if elbow is stable in 30, 40, 30 and above, 30, 40, 50 degrees of flexion, you can just manage them in a sling or a brace or a plaster, well, plaster slab only for 10 days. However, if it's unstable, then you do a ligament repair like in a terrible triad situation. If it's a chronic PLRI, you will take a clinical history, you will do your pivot shift test, you can do your MRI scans, your X-rays. And if the ligament is partly intact, if it's a grade one, two, you just do some sort of reinforcement imbrication. If ligament is completely gone, completely absent, you can take a Maris Longus autograft or an allograft. Uh, and then let's come to uh, Montagia. So most important with Montagia is it's, it's a fairly common fracture. Uh, one, the relationship of radial head to ulna is gone compared to trans -olecranon. Two, because radial head has come out of annular ligament, very occasionally it may not come back. So you may have to do the relevant approach um, take off the annular ligament and re reduce it and reattach annular ligament. The most important with Montagia is the anatomy to the proximal ulna. So this was a cadaveric study. And remember, ulna is not a straight bone. It has this dorsal angulation, which is roughly five degrees at five centimeters from the tip. So if I go from the tip of olecranon, if I go five centimeters, that's where this angulation of five degree comes. And it also has a varus bow. Significance being, you can't put a straight plate. Ulna is not a straight bone in both coronal and sagittal plane. So please remember that the reason being, unless you restore this PUDA, P-U-D-A, proximal ulna diaphyseal angle. Proximal ulna diaphyseal angle, which is roughly five degrees, mean of five degrees. Unless you restore that, radial head will not reduce or if you forcibly reduce it, put a wire from radius to capitalum somehow to make x-rays look good, that patient will always have lateral sided pain and instability. So same thing here, uh, PUDA, which is five degrees, five cent, uh, which is roughly, uh, okay, which is roughly uh, five degrees uh, at five centimeters. So five degrees at five centimeters, easy to remember. So if you have to do a Montagia fracture dislocation, for example, in this case, this was, I think very recent case, April, just like a month and a half, two months ago. So a three-year-old girl, uh, important is once I get my PUDA right, this anterior dislocated radial head should fall back, uh, important. So, impo so again, posterior approach, what I would do is just put two screws, or two compression screws, compress the fracture, and then uh, check on II, make sure radial head has come back, check the pronation supination, check the stability. Once you're happy, then you fill up the plate. Okay, so that, that's the only take home message. The anatomy of proximal ulna, the PUDA, uh, when you put a plate, uh, sort of, you need to be aware that it's, it's not a straight bone. And in this case, for example, if radial head had not come back, then I would still use the posterior approach to like a Bado type approach to reduce the radial head. I've got one or two pictures I'll show you in the next couple of slides. So in other case, I think this was February earlier this year, 56, you can see there's a Montagia, radial head has come out anterior, uh, fracture there, and you see the whole forearm, there's another fracture there, yeah? So both these fractures need to be addressed. 
So remember your pudas, remember your radius bone. Now we, at least in UK, don't have a bone, uh, a plate, which can span the whole dorsum of ulna. So what I've done is I've taken a pre-contoured plate and went past this fracture and then just put another sort of a semi-tubular plate, uh, uh, piggyback it, and then span this fracture. So, you, so message here is you can span, with a dorsal approach, you can span the whole ulna with a plate. Obviously last five to eight, five to six, five to eight centimeters of ulna, preferably I would like to put a plate in the front because at the back you have EDM and other tendons. But in this case, obviously it's, it's because it's a dorsal plate, I have just used the same incision, put a dorsal plate. And again, uh, don't fill up all the holes. I uh, put two screws first, make sure radial head comes, uh, reduces, check the stability, then fill up the holes. So this was the approach uh, I was talking about. Uh, yeah, that's the approach. So obviously to put our ulna plate, we've gone from the back. So that's the posterior approach. And then what happens is if you see this picture there, uh, so we, we come, that's posterior, we're coming from the back, uh, putting a plate on the ulna. Now, if this radial head was in the front, if for some reason annular ligament was interposed and it was not reducing, so I can go between my anconius and ulna. That's my posterior interval. That's my posterior bedo approach. So to lift off anconius like we have lifted off, he off here. So then I can visually take off this annular ligament away, reduce my radial head and reattach my anconius. Uh, so that's your posterior approach, your bedo approach. Uh, so, and obviously from the posterior approach, uh, I can put a plate and I can do radial head replacements. I can do radial head fixation and then reattach your LUCL with anchors or transosseous sutures. So for example, here, uh, gone posteriorly, did my void interval approach. So that's ulna. This is where anconius was, which is all sitting here now. So immediately annular ligament is also in the leaf here. I can see the back of radius. Uh, radius is now articulating with my sigmoid notch uh, and I can put a plate, I can do a replacement and then see that leaf has got my anconius. You can see the muscle under will be LUCL, do some anchors or transosseous sutures, reattach my LUCL to supinate a crest of ulna and do some stitches on the muscle and uh, that's the posterior approach. So elbow, we've talked about medial approaches, lateral approaches, posterior approach, anterior approach you almost never do other than those supracondylars with a vascular injury. So I think, uh, oh, one second. I think that is the end of it if I remember. Yeah, so thank you uh, for your time and attention and good luck to all of you. I only have one more thing to add that there's a lot of, uh, uh, I've included a lot of slides, a lot of sort of material. Uh, terrible triad is a bit difficult topic. So discuss with your consultants, the concepts, see one or two cases, uh, see, get, like you need to get in your mind, there are only four injuries, lateral ligament, medial ligament, radial head, coronoid capsule goes hand in hand. MCL, you almost never repair unless you're going from a medial approach, then you're committed, why not put an anchor and repair it? Uh, radial head, plate, not a good, good implant, screws, how to use them, radial head, safe zone, replacement, understuffing is as is bad, overstuffing is really bad, how to get the height right, uh, ligament, both ligaments, lateral ligament comes off humerus, put an anchor, medial ligaments comes off sublime tubercle from ulna, put an anchor, so it's really not difficult. Capsule or coronoid, coronoid big chunk, put a plate, Capsule, I like retrograde those suture lasso technique. Some people will do it with anchors also. Anchor is not a strong repair. So think about it, read one or two current concepts. These are the current concepts actually. I've gone through a lot of papers. This is the latest, uh, how we fix it. Sean O'Driscoll, Jupiter, Graham King, David Ring. These are the masters of elbow in America and Canada. I've included their papers. Uh, 
yeah, and once you discuss with your seniors, I'm sure you'll get your head around it. So good luck and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for yet another fantastic lecture. It is always so nice listening to you. You go into so much into detail and a lot of things are so much into the current practice. I mean, it's so up to date. I don't think you need anything more than this to know more about all these kind of injuries. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you. There are just a couple of questions. Um, one is, see, the moment you see a medial dislocation, you make, I mean, uh, there's no other associated injury. If you see a simple medial dislocation, it means you need to repair it, is it? Uh, yes. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a very rare injury, Dr. Hitesh. Uh, so far in my practice, I've only seen one case. So it's, it's, it's a very rare injury, but this is a very different kettle of fish to a simple posterior dislocation. So I would say if you see this injury, no point treating in plaster, it'll almost always come out, repair the lateral ligament and the extensor muscles. I would do that personally. Because I see a lot of times in clinical practice, no one has a time to look at the APU. They see the elbow dislocation, they just let it sit and that's it. True, true, so true. There are only two things to say here. If I'm, I, I don't know whether picture will project. So if this is my arm, whatever we do with arm like this, we are always in various stress. So MCL always heals up because of various stress, but LCL gets stretched all the time. So that's why the most important component when I do a terrible triad also is the repair of LUCL. You really need to pull it up to where it belongs and attach it to the isometric point. MCL tends to heal up. But medial injury, as you said, we, we should uh, repair it day one. Okay. The second question is, uh, what is the role for a hinged elbow fixator, the Hotchkiss elbow fixator? Is uh, there a role for current role for these injuries? They talk about it for completeness sake. I have never put one in 30 terrible triads so far. If your capsule, coronoid, radial head, and LUCL are done properly, you will will not even come to repairing MCL. And if you still have to repair MCL, then comes X-Fix, if it's still sagging down. It's an extremely rare implant to be used in elbow, actually, X-Fix. For some open injuries, sort of extremely rare. I have worked at King's College for three years in a major trauma center. I ended up putting one X-Fix in three years, even in a major trauma center. So it's not, if you have to, yes, do a hinge one, don't move it for 10 days or for two weeks and then start moving in a X fix for a month and then take it off. So if you have to use it, but as I said, practically, if you address your injuries properly, almost you'll, you'll do one in 10, 15 years of your career, if that. And a quick takeaway message. What, what are the scenarios? I mean, you've gone through it in detail. I know that, but what are the scenarios where you are repairing the MCL? So, so MCL, I will, if I'm doing a med, if my radial head is intact, then I cannot address my capsule from a lateral approach. Then I'm addressing my capsule through a medial approach. So if, if I've already done the tissue dissection, I've done, then I do my capsule, MCL is looking at me, why not put an anchor and attach it? So that is one scenario in my practice. Second scenario is, if you've done your three things, capsule, coronoid, radial head, and lateral ligament, and if it is, if there's still a posterior sac, which as I said, is maybe in two elbow, two terrible triads after, out of 100, I would do five terrible triads in a year. 100 means 20 years of practice. So, oh, sorry, 100 elbows mean 20 years of practice, exactly. So in 20 years of practice, I'll do two MCL, basically unless I'm doing a medial approach. So it's, it's a very rare thing to address, unless okay, you're doing a medial approach. A very, very rare scenario that you're going to repair the MCL, is it? Uh, unless you've done a medial approach to address capsule. Okay, and uh, sort of uh, my very close friend, uh, Senthil from Texas is also in this uh, chat room on Zoom, and he's a staff orthopedic surgeon in uh, Dallas, Texas, and he's uh, trained in PGA. And he is he's also very keen uh, to discuss something about you. Sentil. Hi. Hello, uh, Sentil. Hi, how are you, sir? Good, good, sir. Great talk. You know, I learned a lot. So, um, Thank you. So, 
there are a couple of questions here. One is when you have a subtle who had a posterior dislocation, it was radiated in the ER, they come back to the clinic and you feel like it looks good in the x-ray, but there is a little flake in the coronoid or maybe a tiny delta sign. Do you, is there a role for stress x-rays or? Uh, there is a role, but by the time you go, patient is in pain, sometimes they may not comply. I mm -hmm. would get a CT to get a bit more information like I showed, and I would, I would take them personally to EOA. If oh, I have a clear delta sign, I may do an EOA under sedation to start with. If mm -hmm. I, like in this case, elbow completely came out. So mm -hmm. what I could have done was an MRI to see my dynamic uh, stabilizers, and if my extensors and flexors uh, lit up and I knew they were gone, then I knew patient needed surgery. But again, we work under constraints. You do a CT, if I order an MRI, they'll kill me. So mm -hmm. I'll rather take patient to theater, do a EUA under sedation. And as I was showing you in the posterior sag, I medical legally I covered my back. It was sagging at 60 degrees, put a patient to sleep and then repair, do the necessary repairs. Mm -hmm. Is there a role for elbow arthrogram? To... Uh, elbow, uh, why would you do elbow arthrograms? Do I capsular. Uh, not really terrible try. I would do elbow arthrogram, for example, if I'm doing a lateral condyle in a child. Uh -huh. Then for medical legally to show the reduction, I always put a dye in because it's okay. all cartilage. Uh -huh. I'll show the that cartilage is all congruous. Uh, so mm -hmm. that if uh, sort of there is a, some growth plate injury, my back mm -hmm. is covered. But uh, in terrible try, I wouldn't uh, personally think of a scenario where I should do an arthrogram. Okay. All right. And uh, your choice of radial replacement. Uh, do you, how do you uh, like uh, decide which way, which is your So we uh, have, so we, I use Acumed. We uh -huh. also have Evolve on the shelf here, but our bottom line is, is, is porous coated, is press fit, is bipolar. Okay. Most uh -huh. important with radial head is uh, basically the, to get the height right. Uh -huh. So height, I have shown those delta signs and like in a neutral, it should be a little broad. And then clinically, we can see if the radial head is articulating with the sigmoid notch. So there are lots of little, little tips and tricks which we can see on table. Mm -hmm. uh, and then other thing with radial head replacement will be the terrible triad situation, which I deliberately omitted because you don't want to confuse examining candidates. When I've done my suture lasso for my capsule, I don't put a knot in the beginning. Uh, the reason being it allows me to sublux to create that PLRI to get my radius out. So my radial head replacement becomes easy. So once I've done radial head replacement, and well, then I reduce the elbow and stitch the capsule at the back, put a knot. And uh, for chronic PLRIs, what is your graft or choice? Uh, I don't do chronic injuries. I work in a DGH. Uh, I've seen it on cadavers. Uh, we will refer it to a tertiary center, King's College. Oh, again, chronic PLRI, I don't know how, how much you see in your practice. I, I have not even seen one in DGH in last four years since I've been at Prue. It's that rare, actually. Yeah, okay, and yeah. in UK, we have to send them to tertiary centers to a pure elbow surgeon. Okay, I do yeah. older elbow hands. So if I do them, they will, GMC will call me next day. Be, okay. We will use so, Comaris Longers. You can use holographs. I've done them on cadaver for completeness sake. Practically, I wouldn't do. Sounds good. Great. Mm -hmm. Hitesh, you have any questions? Well, actually, because uh, said, uh, Dr. Agarwal has come, covered everything, and I don't want to tire him more. It's a big, long lecture, and I don't want to ask him more questions than Darren because he is uh, certainly uh, Dr. Agarwal has given him two lectures prior with us, and it's already close to 1,500 views combined and oh. liked and shared by almost everyone. That's great. You know, you know, it was really nice having him on. Very um, good, to, yeah. uh, good to see you and talk to you, Dr. Senzel. Very good to uh, see you. Nice talking to you, Dr. Agarwal. You know, great yes. talk, you know. Very, yes. very informative, educative. So, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Uh, thank you for joining us once again and uh, for this wonderful, enlightening lecture. And we really look forward for yet another lecture from your side. Thank you, Dr. Hitesh, for your kind in invitation. Have thank a good day, so Dr. Senzel. Yeah. You too, thank sir. You Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. You too. Take care. Thank you. Look after yourself. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Bye-bye.